When Joel Rifkin was finally arrested, he stunned the country with his confession. Mr. Rifkin has spoke of 17 homicides that he uh, committed. After the confession, a frantic search for bodies. On 513, they recovered a body in an oil drum in northern Brooklyn. Yesterday, a body was recovered under a mattress near JFK Airport. Rifkin's killing spree lasted from 1989 to 1993. He murdered women, brutally strangling them with his hands. He was sentenced to more than 200 years in prison. You have been found to have knowingly committed the most heinous act one can commit against a fellow human being, the taking of a life. Rifkin is now in solitary confinement for his own protection. He agreed to talk to us. He says he wants to know why he killed 17 times. I'd like to know what happened. I mean, I didn't start out to, with my goal to end up here. I mean, the crime what I was accused of was, was more than normal, more than simple tragic crime. And now it's, how did I get here? Is there something wrong? Is there nothing wrong? Is this a, am I just evil? Am I brain damaged? And these are questions I want to answer. Rifkin was 30 years old when he murdered the first woman, a prostitute he brought to his childhood home in East Meadow, New York. He began by beating her with a metal object. It was a, an old howitzer shell from World War II. And I ended up beating her severely on the head with that until I basically got tired of swinging it. And I have no idea how many times that was. But she was still breathing, moving. So Rifkin grabbed her throat. I wrapped around her head and we wrestled for a while and she was strangled to death. That first victim has never been identified because Rifkin used a small knife to dismember her body. I took an exacto knife, a little hobby knife, and basically uh, removed her limbs, her legs, head. I guessed approximately where the joints were and just cut everything around them and uh, separated the bones, made little packages. And, Drove as far as uh, the Jersey, Pennsylvania border with some of them. As far away as I could, I could get on, on that much gas. Distributed them many different places? Small as I could, as far as I could. Just make it all go away. Were you sorry at all? Uh, I'm not sure I felt anything. Uh, it was just something that happened. and. You know, had no plans to repeat it, just go away, go on with my normal life, just forget about it. But over the next four years, Rifkin killed at least 16 more times. Police say his victims were prostitutes, easy targets whose disappearance often goes unreported or even unnoticed. Rifkin says he could never predict which woman he would kill and which he would spare. Once it started, it wasn't every girl. It was the occasional girl. It was, uh, I could be with a girl on a Friday, another girl on a Saturday, be with a second girl on Saturday, and she'd be, end up dead. And the others were fine. And then be with a girl on Monday, and she'd be fine. So it, I never understood it. Rifkin says he adjusted the time and place he would see prostitutes in a conscious attempt to keep himself from killing. I even switched from night to day because there's more people. So again, less likely to happen. That didn't work out either. Again, uh, that just would occur. He says in the moment of each murder, he felt no hesitation, no remorse. There was no thought of if I should let go of this person's throat or keep holding the person's throat or any thought at all. Just grab it and hold on. Basically told my hands got tired. He killed for the last time in Manhattan on June 24, 1993, at dawn. His final victim, 22-year-old Tiffany Bresciani. He brought her body back to his family home. I stopped at a parking lot, wrapped the body in the tarp, put her in the trunk. Mom borrowed the car. Mom brings the car home. I drove Mom to work. I then put the body in the garage, wrapped up in the tarp. Three days later, in the middle of the night, he put the body in his pickup truck and drove off. The police began to chase him, not because of the body, 
but because his license plate had fallen off. They discovered the body almost immediately, but they did not know they had a serial killer until hours later, after Rifkin had confessed to 16 additional murders. How did you feel when it was clear that it was over? I wasn't angry at myself, wasn't angry at the police. It was, you know, I was calm about it. Even now, Rifkin says his crimes are a mystery to him. Did you feel like you were in control or that you were out of control? Behaving mechanically, autopilot, completing a task, just starting something and, f and finishing it. Just uh, autopilot's the best way to describe it. Do you think you could answer the question why? That's, the, to me, the real mystery. Uh, you know, why? Why am I different from, let's say, you or anybody else? How did you get through school and high school and go to college and, and uh, get what's considered a normal nine-to-five job and fit into society, and how come I didn't? That is, that's what puzzles me. To try to figure out why he killed, Rifkin agreed to let neurologist Jonathan Pincus examine him. I'm going to do some tests. Uh, to see if the root of his violence can be found in his brain. Keep your eyes right on my finger. When we come back, the search for the causes of violence takes scientists inside the human brain and into the animal kingdom. Once again, Steve Abison. At the time of the murders, Joel Rifkin lived here at the family home in East Meadow, New York, just outside of New York City. When looking for clues as to why Rifkin became a serial killer, it is tempting to begin here to see if there was any past abuse or traumatic experience that may have triggered the violence. Jean Rifkin still lives in the same house where many of the murders took place. She says she tries not to dwell on her son's gruesome crimes. What's done is done, and I say, tomorrow is another day. It's the only way I can function. To this day, she has trouble accepting the murders her son committed. I really don't know how I feel. I mean, I, f I can't forgive what he did, but I can forgive him. Joel Rifkin was just an infant when he was adopted in 1959. Jean Rifkin remembers how thrilled she was to finally bring a baby home. It was delightful. He was a very sweet, friendly kid, interested in a lot of things, but had a smile for everybody. Another baby, a girl, was adopted a few years later. Both Rifkin and his mother paint the same picture of the family one with plenty of love and support. They insist there was absolutely no abuse at home. And in your childhood, no abuse of any kind? Except for at schoolyards, no. Rifkin impressed his parents with his curiosity, but early on he began to struggle. Severe dyslexia made it difficult to read, and physically he was extremely uncoordinated. His parents tried to help. We gave him a lot of attention, and uh... Well, he was a very willing uh, subject. I mean, he loved to be read to. So, I mean, he was always interested in everything. Still, from an early age, Rifkin had trouble fitting in with other kids in the neighborhood. We had a bunch of uh, kids a little bit older than him, but some his age, right here in the neighborhood. And they used to play ball on the corner. And he would sit there, dying to play, dying to be part of the group. They wouldn't let him play. Things were even worse at school, where Rifkin was brutally teased by peers. I managed to hang on the edges. Uh, they kept basically pushing me away and I kept coming back. And that caused a lot of other tensions in school. His social skills were apparently not well developed. And I think this pet may have been one of the reasons that he was the patsy or the uh, scapegoat so often. Rifkin was the target of pranks and physical attacks. Everything from being shoved against a locker to having his head pounded against the ground. Only rarely did Rifkin tell his parents about the attacks. When he did, they tried not to intervene. So we just tried to reassure him 
and tried to show him that he can't allow this to happen, that he has to fight back even if he gets hurt. But through all the pain and embarrassment, Rifkin never defended himself. I kind of learned if you did fight back, uh, you got really decked. It just wasn't uh, getting hurt, it was getting beaten. Then in 1987, after a brief battle with cancer, Rifkin's father committed suicide. Two years later, the killing spree began. Most of the killings seemed to happen within a week of some type of personal anniversary or holiday. The first one was the second anniversary of my father's death. Was Rifkin's killing spree somehow triggered by traumatic events like his father's suicide or his own experience of being bullied? In fact, over the years, scientists have found that many killers were taunted as children, raising the general question, can constant humiliation or abuse actually lead to violence? Dr. Peter Bregan, with the International Center for the Study of Psychiatry, thinks it can. Most people who commit murder, in fact, don't feel strong, but feel weak, ashamed, and every time we create situations where people are continually ridiculed and humiliated and put down, we are going to have violence. 